hard as diamonds, soft as moonlight, warm as sunlight, cold as frost in the stars, proud and far off as a snow mountain, and as merry as any lass I ever saw, with daisies in her hair in springtime. Today, we narrate the life of Galadriel in the first stage. Galadriel's life begins during the first stage, before the sun and moon are even created, when the measure of time is still calculated according to the years of the trees. She is born in 1362 of the years of the trees, in Eldamar, the land of the elves in Valinor. Galadriel descends from an extremely royal bloodline, being the daughter of Prince Finarfin of the Noldor, son of King Finwë and Queen Indis of the Vanyar, and of Earwen, the swan maiden of Alqualonde, daughter of King Colwë of the Falmari, the teller in elves of Valinor. She is the youngest sibling among four children, and the only daughter, her older brothers are Finrod Felagund, Angrod, and Tygnor. Through her father, Finarfin, Galadriel is related to many important characters of the Legendarium. She is the niece of Fingolfin and of Feanor, and the first cousin of the latter seven sons, and of the four children of Fingolfin, which include Turgon, the great-grandfather of Felerond Half-Elven, Galadriel, even in her early years, proves to be a powerful and special elf with extraordinary gifts, one of the greatest of the house of Finwë. Finarfin names his only daughter Artanis, which is Quenya for noble woman. Due to Artanis' heightened stature, her great strength of body and will, and her courage, Earwen, her mother, names her Nerwen, which is Quenya, for man-maiden. Her mother name was Nerwen, man-maiden, and she grew to be tall beyond the measure even of the women of the Noldor. She was strong of body, mind, and will a match for both the lore masters and the athletes of the Eldar in the days of their youth. It is recorded that Galadriel is the tallest of all elven women in the entirety of the Legendarium. Galadriel, the tallest of all the women of the Eldar of whom tales tell, was said to be Manhai, but it is noted according to the measure of the Dunedain and the men of fold indicating a height of about 6 feet 4 inches. In the peoples of Middle-earth, we are told that of the four children of Inarfin, the most famed are Finrod and Galadriel. The most renowned of these were the first and the fourth, the only daughter, and only of these two are the mother names remembered. In youth, Galadriel is fond of wandering afar, away from the home of her kin, and she also often visits the Teleri of Alqualonde, the people of her mother. While dwelling in Valinor, she becomes a pupil of the Valar, Aul and Yavanna, and being one of the Noldor, she has a passionate love of crafts of hand. Galadriel quickly learns all that the Valar teach the elves. Being brilliant in mind and swift in action, she had early absorbed all of what she was capable of the teaching which the Valar thought fit to give the Eldar, and she felt confined in the tutelage of Amman. Tolkien even compares Galadriel to her uncle, Feanor himself, who is the most gifted among the Noldor, regarding them the greatest of the Eldar of Valinor, a wholly different story, adumbrated but never told, of Galadriel's conduct at the time of the rebellion of the Noldor, appears in a very late and partly illegible note, the last writing of my fathers on the subject of Galadriel and Celeborn, and probably the last on Middle-earth and Valinor, set down in the last month of his life. 
In this, he emphasized the commanding stature of Galadriel already in Valinor, the equal, if unlike, endowment of Feanor. Like all the children of Inarfin, Galadriel inherits his golden hair, which comes to the family from the Vanyar through Galadriel's grandmother, Indis, the second wife of Finwë. A sister they had, Galadriel, most beautiful of all the house of Finwë. Her hair was lit with gold, as though it had caught in a mess the radiance of Laurelin. This feature marks out Galadriel and her brothers among the princes of the Noldor, but the hair of Galadriel is a unique feature of hers, for it is exceptionally beautiful. Galadriel and her brother Finrod were the children of Finarfin, the second son of Findis. Finarfin was of his mother's kind, in mind and body, having the golden hair of the Vanyar, their noble and gentle temper, and their love of the Valar. Galadriel was the greatest of the Noldor, except Fëanor maybe, though she was wiser than he, and her wisdom increased with the long years. Even among the Eldar she was accounted beautiful, and her hair was held a marvel unmatched. It was golden like the hair of her father and of her foremother Indis, but richer and more radiant, for its gold was touched by some memory of the star-like silver of her mother, and the Eldar said that the light of the two trees, Laurelin and Telperion, had been snared in her tresses. The fact that the hair of Galadriel has trapped the gold and silver light of the two trees plays a significant role throughout the history of Middle-earth, for it is believed among the elves that it is due to it that Feanor conceives the idea of imprisoning the light of the trees. Many thought that this saying first gave to Feanor the thought of imprisoning and blending the light of the trees that later took shape in his hands as the Silmarils. For Feanor beheld the hair of Galadriel with wonder and delight. He begged three times for a tress, but Galadriel would not give him even one hair. These two kinsfolk, the greatest of the Eldar of Valinor, were unfriends forever, who together with the greatest of all the Eldar, Luthien Tinuviel, daughter of Elu Thingol, are the chief matter of the legends and histories of the elves. Galadriel not giving Feanor even one strand of her hair will again be brought to the foreground thousands of years later, in Lothlorien, during her life in the Blessed Realm, apart from the names given to her by her parents, Galadriel receives another name, Alatariel. This name is an epese, or nickname, given to her while she is young, referring to the brilliant sheen of her golden-silver hair, which in her youth she wears in three long braids, the middle one being wound about her head, it is a secondary name given to her in her youth, in the far past, because she had long hair which glistened like gold, but was also sought with silver. She was then of Amazon disposition, and bound up her hair as a crown when taking part in athletic feats. Tolkien provides many translations of this name of hers. Maiden crowned with a garland of bright radiance, Maiden crowned with a radiant garland, glittering garland, and Maiden crowned with gleaming hair. This name will be translated to Sindarin later in Beleriand and become the more familiar Galadriel. She herself accepts and chooses this as her Sindarin name in Middle-earth, rather than her father or mother's, as it is the most beautiful among her names. During her early life in Amman, Galadriel is proud and rebellious and wishes for freedom, but she is also generous and kind-hearted, distrusting Feanor only. 
Galadriel was born in the bliss of Valinor, but it was not long in the reckoning of the blessed realm before that was deemed, and thereafter she had no peace within, for in that testing time amid the strife of the Noldor she was drawn this way and that, she was proud, strong, and self-willed, as were all the descendants of Finwë save Finarfin, and like her brother Finrod, of all her kin the nearest to her heart, she had dreams of far lands and dominions that might be her own to order, as she would without tutelage. Yet deeper still, there dwelt in her the noble and generous spirit of the Vanyar, and her reverence for the Valar that she could not forget. From her earliest years, she had the marvelous gift of insight into the minds of others, but judged them with mercy and understanding, and she withheld her good will from none, save only Feanor. In him she perceived a darkness that she hated and feared, though she did not perceive that the shadow of the same evil had fallen upon the minds of all the Noldor and upon her own. Between 1449 and 1450 of the years of the trees, Feanor, being come to his full might, begins a long and secret labor, and he summons all his power and his subtle skill, creating in the end the Silmarils. These are three great jewels in form, but the inner fire Feanor makes of the blended light of the two trees of Valinor, Forty-five years of the trees later, in 1495, Morgoth and Ungoliant, the ancestor of Silob, destroy the two trees of Valinor and steal the Silmarils of Feanor, and they flee to Middle-earth. Afterwards, turmoil before the land of the Valar. Feanor suddenly appears in Tyrion, the city of the Noldor, and calls on all the elves to come to him, and swiftly a great multitude of them gathers about him to hear his speech. Feanor is a master of words, and his tongue has great power over hearts when he uses it. Hearing him speaking, many of the Noldor are stirred to madness, then urging the Noldor to rebel against the Valar, he and his seven sons swear a terrible oath, an oath that will thereafter affect the whole of Middle-earth's history. Feanor's words influence even the royal family of the Noldor. Galadriel's uncle and cousin, Fingolfin and Turgon, speak against Feanor, and Finrod, her brother, is with them. Finarfin, her father, speaks softly, seeking to calm the Noldor, but Galadriel herself is among those who desire to depart from Valinor, though for different reasons than Feanor. But Galadriel, the only woman of the Noldor, to stand that day tall and valiant among the contending princes, was eager to be gone. No oath she swore, but the words of Feanor concerning Middle-earth had kindled in her heart, for she yearned to see the white unguarded lands and to rule there a realm at her own will. Of like mind with Galadriel is her cousin Fingon, Fingolfin's son, being also moved by Feanor's words, though he loves him little and with Fingon stand Dangrod and Tygnor, the other two brothers of Galadriel. Another reason for which Galadriel is willing to join the rebellion of the Noldor is to aid her Sindarin relatives in Middle-earth, the kin of her mother and grandfather, Olwë, and his children were thus the kin of King Kelu Thingol of Doriath in Beleriand, for he was the brother of Olwë, and this kinship influenced their decision to join in the exile, and proved of great importance later in Beleriand. So Galadriel eventually joins the flight of the Noldor as one of the leaders of the second host, the host of Ingolfin. So it came to pass that when the light of Valinor failed, forever as the Noldor thought, she joined the rebellion against the Valar, who commanded them to stay, 
and once she had set foot upon that road of exile, she would not relent, but rejected the last message of the Valar, and came under the doom of Mandos. Moving on, Feanor, aiming to follow Morgoth, leads the Noldor northward, reaching Alqualonde, the city of the Falmari, Galadriel skiing through her mother. Then, with the grace of his words, he speaks with the Teleri, asking them to lend him their ships, but they are unmoved, and they rather try to dissuade him from departing. Thus Feanor and his host head to the haven of the swans, beginning to steal the ships of the Teleri, but the Teleri withstand him, and so befalls the first kinslaying, the first of the three slayings of elf by elf. In this conflict Galadriel arrives with the second host of the Noldor, which shows up later than Feanor's, and she fights against him and his followers. Even after the merciless assault upon the Teleri and the rape of their ships, though she fought fiercely against Feanor in defense of her mother's skin, she did not turn back. In the nature of Middle-earth, we are also told that in this confrontation, Galadriel quarrels and fights with the sons of Feanor, and that she has little love for them. In the end, the Teleri are overcome, and the Noldor win the day. Thereupon, Feanor and his host man the ships of the Teleri, and the Noldor head north along the coast, the ones bound to Feanor by ship, and those following Fingolfin by land. Galadriel is still unwilling to turn back, and so far from joining in Feanor's revolt, she stands in every way opposed to him. Her pride was unwilling to return, a defeated suppliant for pardon, but now she bears with desire to follow Feanor with her anger to whatever lands he might come, and to thwart him in all ways that she could. The way north is long and ever more evil, as Galadriel and the rest go forward. They march for a great while in the unmeasured night, until they reach Araman, near the Helcaraxe, the grinding guys in the far north of Farda. There the Noldor suddenly behold a dark figure standing high upon a rock, and some believe that it is the Valamandos himself. The figure then speaks the doom of the Noldor, the curse pronouncing that a great woe will come upon the elves who will abandon the blessed realm. In that tower, Finarfin, Galadriel's father, forsakes the march and turns back, becoming the king of the Noldor in Valinor. But she and her brothers do not relent and they keep moving forward. Deeming the Helcaraxe impassable, Feanor and his sons suddenly seize the ships of the Falmari and head for Middle-earth. Galadriel remains behind with Fingolfin and the rest of her family. Upon reaching the Lamoth to the northwest of Beleriand, Feanor burns the ships of the Teleri, and Galadriel and the rest see the light from afar, perceiving now that they are betrayed. Then Fingolfin, seeing that Feanor had left him to perish in Araman, or return in shame to Valinor, was filled with bitterness, but he desired now as never before to come by some way to Middle-earth and meet Feanor again, and he and his host wandered long in misery, but their valor and endurance grew with hardship, for they were a mighty people, the elder children undying of Feru Ilúvatar, but new come from the blessed realm, and not yet weary with the weariness of earth. The fire of their hearts was young, and led by Fingolfin and his sons, and by Finrod and Galadriel, the valiant and fair, they dared to pass into the bitterest north, and finding no other way, they endured at last the terror of the Helcaraxe and the cruel hills of Fais. Few of the deeds of the Noldor thereafter surpassed that desperate crossing in hardihood or woe.
There Elenwe, the wife of Turgon, was lost, and many others perished also, and it was with a lesson host that Fingolfin set foot at last upon the outer lands. Small love for Feanor or his sons had those that marched at last behind him, and blew their trumpets in Middle-earth at the first rising of the moon. King Thingol of Doriath does not welcome with a full heart the coming of the Noldor, and so he does not open his kingdom for them, but Galadriel and the rest of the house of Inarfin he permits to enter into his realm, and Melian the Maya allows them to pass through her girdle, which protects the realm of Doriath, for they claim close kinship with Thingol himself, since their mother is his niece, Earwen of Alqualonde, the daughter of his brother, Olwe. Thus Galadriel and her brother Finrod soon become the guests of Thingol and Melian in Doriath, but shortly after Finrod departs and heads to the caverns of Narog to begin the construction of his stronghold of Nargothrond. Galadriel does not join him, as she desires to stay with Melian, the queen, with whom she has become a close friend, and also because there has started to grow much love between her and Celeborn, the grandson of King Thingol's brother, Elmo, whom she has met there. Galadriel, his sister, went not with him to Nargothrond, for in Doriath dwelt Celeborn, kinsman of Thingol, and there was great love between them. Therefore she remained in the hidden kingdom, and abode with Melian, and of her learned great lore and wisdom concerning Middle-earth. Galadriel and Celeborn do not participate in the war against Morgoth, deeming it impossible to defeat him without the intervention of the Valar. In the years after, they did not join in the war against Angband, which they judged to be hopeless under the ban of the Valar, and without their aid. During the dreadful years of the wars with Morgoth, despite their love, Galadriel and Celeborn do not get married, following the custom among the Eldar of avoiding marriage and childbearing during the war, but they are eventually betrothed before the overthrow of Morgoth. Meanwhile, the western core necessary to make Lembas has been lost in Beleriand, but Galadriel and others of the Noldor, coming from Valinor, have brought it back, with Melian also benefiting from this. But when the Noldor came back, they brought with them new corn, and it, by a special grace of pity by Manwend Varda, did not fail, and was still in vigor till the end of the first age. Galadriel was one of the chief inheritors of it, and of the art. Years pass in Doriath, and Galadriel becomes dear to Melian, and they speak often together about Valinor. At times Melian and Galadriel would speak together of Valinor and the bliss of old, but beyond the dark hour of the death of the trees, Galadriel would not go, but ever fell silent, and on a time Melian said, there is some woe that lies upon you and your kin, that I can see in you, but all else is hidden from me, for by no vision or thought can I perceive anything that passed or passes in the west. A shadow lies over all the land of Aman, and reaches far out over the sea. Why will you not tell me more? For that woe is past, said Galadriel and I would take what joy is here left, untroubled by memory, and maybe there is woe enough yet to come, though still hope may seem bright. Then Melian looked in her eyes and said, I believe not that the Noldor came forth as messengers of the Valar, as was said at first, not though they came in the very hour of her need, for they speak never of the Valar, nor have their High Lords brought any message to Thingol, whether from Manwe, or Ulmo, 
or even from Olwe, the king's brother, and his own folk that went over the sea. For what cause Galadriel were the high people of the Noldor driven forth as exiled from Amman? Or what evil lies on the sons of Feanor that they are so haughty and so fair? Do I not strike near the truth? Near, lady, save that we were not driven forth, but came of our own will and against that of the Valar and through great peril, and in despite of the valor, for this purpose we came, to take vengeance upon Morgoth, and regain what he stole. Then Galadriel spoke to Melian of the Silmarils, and of the slaying of King Finwë at Formenos, but still she said no word of the oath, nor of the kinslaying, nor of the burning of the ships at Losgar. But Melian, who looked still in her eyes as he spoke, said, Now much you tell me, and yet more I perceive, a darkness you would cast over the long road from Tyrion, but I see evil there, which Fingol should learn for his guidance. Maybe, but not of me. And Melian spoke then no more of these matters with Galadriel, but she told to King Thingol all that she had heard of the Silmarils. Thus Thingol becomes concerned regarding the Noldor, and soon after he is informed of the Noldor's dark deeds in Amman. In the year 67 of the First Age, it chances that the three brothers of Galadriel are the guests of Thingol and Melian, for they desire to see their sister again. But Thingol wrongly accuses the children of Inarfin of slaying their mother's kin in the kinslaying at Alqualonde. Then Angrod, the second child of Finarfin, reveals the truth to him and speaks bitterly against the sons of Feanor. Thingol bids them to leave, though he does not shut the doors of his realm against them, for they are his kindred. So the brothers of Galadriel depart from Doriath with heavy hearts, but she stays in the realm still for many more years. In the year 102, the construction of the kingdom of Nargothrond is completed, and a feast is held for all the children of Inarfin, and Galadriel visits her brothers from Doriath. It came to pass that Nargothrond was full wrought, and the sons of Inarfin were gathered there to a feast, and Galadriel came from Doriath and dwelt a while in Nargothrond. While dwelling in her brother's kingdom, Galadriel asks Finrod why he remains unmarried, and he answers with dark foresights about himself and about Nargothrond, his kingdom. It is not recorded for how long Galadriel stays in Nargothrond, but at a given moment she returns to Doriath again. Many centuries later, in the year 420, Galadriel hears another foretelling, now from Melian the Maya. Now the world runs on swiftly to great tidings, and one of men, even of Beor's house, shall indeed come, and the girdle of Melian shall not restrain him for doom greater than my power shall send him, and the songs that shall spring from that coming shall endure when all Middle-earth is changed. This man is none other than Beren, who in the future will marry Melian's daughter, Luthien Tinuviel. In the years to follow, the curse of Mandos finally strikes the house of Inarfin, in 455, Galadriel loses two of her brothers, Angrot and Tygnor, who perish fighting in the Dagor Bragolach, the battle of sudden flame, and ten years later, in 465, her last remaining sibling, Finrod Felagund, sacrifices his life to save Beren in the dungeons of Sauron, Therefore, Galadriel alone remains of the children of Inarfin. At some point, Galadriel and Celeborn pass over the mountains to Eriador. 
It is not exactly known when this occurs and if it happens before the fall of Nargothrond and Gondolin, but Christopher Tolkien cites that they might have been present at the ruin of Doriath beginning in the year 506 of the First Age and that they might have assisted Elwing, the mother of Elrond, in escaping. It is a natural assumption that Celeborn and Galadriel were present at the ruin of Doriath and perhaps aided the escape of Felwing to the havens of Sirion with the Silmaril, but this is nowhere stated. Some time before the end of the first stage, Galadriel and Celeborn depart over Ered Lindon, the Blue Mountains, Galadriel probably being the first of all the Noldor to come to the Inner Lands. A possible reason for this is that these two perhaps aim to build up a power to the eastward, as they fear that the Morgoth will draw reinforcements from the regions there. In 545, the final conflict in the war against Morgoth, the War of Wrath, takes place. The host of the Valar arrives in Beleriand and overthrows the first Dark Lord. The leader of the army of the Noldor, who never departed from Valinor, is Finarfin, Galadriel's father. This devastating battle lasts for 42 years and totally destroys Beleriand and sinks its lands under the sea. Before the end of the first stage, Eonwe, the herald of Manwe, summons the elves of Beleriand to the west to receive the pardon of the Valar, but not all the Eldar are willing to forsake Middle-earth, where they have suffered and dwelt for so long, and some decide to linger many an age in the Hitherlands. One of these selves is Galadriel's beloved, Celeborn. Galadriel herself being the only remaining of the leaders in the Noldorin rebellion against the Valar, is not allowed to return to Valinor, and a ban is set upon her. The exiles were allowed to return, save for a few chief actors in the rebellion, of whom at the time of the Lord of the Rings only Galadriel remained. After the overthrow of Morgoth at the end of the first stage, a ban was set upon her return, and she had replied proudly that she had no wish to do so. Thus Galadriel, still being moved by pride, refuses the pardon and forgiveness of the Valar for all who have fought against Morgoth, and remains in Middle-earth. Her love for Celeborn also plays a big part in this decision of hers. For a love of Celeborn, who would not leave Middle-earth, and probably with some pride of her own, for she had been one of those eager to adventure there, she did not go west at the downfall of Melkor, but crossed Ered Lindon with Celeborn and came into Eriador. Probably soon after the overthrow of Morgoth, Galadriel and Celeborn get married, as we learn in the nature of Middle-earth, so the first stage slowly comes to an end and Galadriel heads with Celeborn to Lindon, along with many other elves, like Gil-galad and Telrond. The following years, she will be one of the few to perceive that a shadow will stir again in the form of Sauron and the last remaining of the great among the High Elves and the greatest of Elven women shall stand as one of the chief adversaries and one of the mightiest obstacles against the second Dark Lord. We will cover the incredibly long and fascinating life of the Lady Galadriel in the later ages in future videos. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one on my Govanen Namariel.